Well, thank you uh, for your introductions in both English and Chinese, and for inviting me to your university uh, for the first time in my life. It's too bad I'm too old to enroll. <laughs> Some poems that I don't have here. Uh, they're really uh, pissed off poems. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I can't get that angry. But let me, uh, let me read a few poems about, about my life in Detroit. I grew up in Detroit. Uh, I was born there. I left when I was 26. I left because I wanted to be a poet. Also because I got rid of all my financial burdens. And because uh, Robert Lowell was teaching at the University of Iowa, and I, I kind of loved his poetry. And uh, so I went there. He was a terrible teacher. <laughs> uh, that's OK. Anything to get me out of Detroit. <laughs> this is called What Work Is. Uh, Ford Highland Park uh, was, a, was once the second largest assembly plant for the Ford Cup Corporation. It, now it's uh, largely a warehouse uh, for God knows what. And Actually, it's largely empty. What work is? We stand in the rain in a long line, waiting at Ford Highland Park for work. You know what work is. If you're old enough to read this, you know what work is, although you may not do it. Forget you. This is about waiting, shifting from one foot to another, feeling the light rain falling like mist into your hair, blurring your vision, until you think you see your own brother ahead of you, maybe 10 places. You rub your glasses with your fingers, and of course it's someone else's brother. Narrower across the shoulders than yours, but with the same sad slouch, the grin that does not hide the stubbornness, the sad refusal to give in to rain, to the hours wasted waiting, to the knowledge that somewhere ahead a man is waiting who will say, no, we're not hiring today for any reason he wants. You love your brother. Now suddenly you can hardly stand the love flooding you for your brother. Who's not beside you or behind or ahead. Because he's home. Trying to sleep off a miserable night shift at Cadillac. So he can get up before noon to study his germ. Works eight hours a night so he can sing Wagner, the opera you hate most, the worst music ever invented. <laughs> How long has it been since you told him you loved him? Held his wide shoulders, opened your eyes wide, and said those words, and maybe kissed his cheek. You've never done something so simple, so obvious. Not because you're too young or too dumb. Not because you're jealous or even mean or incapable of crying in the presence of another man. No. Just because you don't know what work is. Actually, the, the most wonderful <coughs> comment on the music of 
Wagner was made by Mark Twain in praise of it. He said, it's better than it sounds. <laughs> Staying with me, I can still see her in my mind. And in a way, I suppose, you know, I loved her. But I never got that close to tell her. Coming close. Take this quiet woman. She has been standing before a polishing wheel for over three hours. She lacks 20 minutes before she can take a lunch break. Is she a woman? Consider the arms as they press the long brass tube against the buffer. They are striated along the triceps, the three heads of which clearly show. Consider the fine dusting of dark down above the upper lip and the beads of sweat that run from under the red kerchief across the brow and are wiped away with a blackening wristband in one odd motion a child might make to say, no, no. You must come closer to find out. You must hang your tie and jacket in one of the lockers in favor of a black smock. You must be prepared to spend shift after shift hauling off the metal trays of stock, bowing first knees bent for a purchase, then lifting with a gasp the first word of tenderness between the two of you. Then you must bring new trays of dull, unpolished tubes. You must feed her as they say in the language of the place. Make no mistake, the place has a language. And if by some luck the power were cut, the wheel slow to a stop, so that you suddenly saw it was not a solid object, but so many separate bristles forming in motion a perfect circle, she would turn to you and say, why? Not the old why of why must I spend five nights a week, just why. Even if by some magic you knew, you wouldn't dare speak for fear of her laughter, which now you have anyway, as she places the five tapering fingers of her filthy hand on the arm of your white shirt 
to mark you for your own, now and forever. You know, as I, as I read that, I came across a word, the word tenderness. And I'm just going to step outside the reading for a few seconds. To remark that the idea of tenderness appearing in poetry was utterly foreign to me for a long time in my life. And one day I was with a wonderful, wonderful American poet who died last week, Galway Canal. And he made a remark about the best poetry. And, and one of the things that he wanted in the best poetry was tenderness. And I don't know how old we both were. We were probably 40, 38, 40, something like that. And I thought, holy cow, where the hell did he come up with that? And I thought about it, and I've thought about it all my life. It is something we want in life so much, and why in the hell shouldn't it be in our poetry? And it hadn't been in my poetry. And, and I thought, yeah, why not? Why don't I? I am capable of it. <laughs> and I'm certainly capable of receiving it. <laughs> and the man that Christina wrote her essay about, Paul Petrie, once wrote me a letter and said, and I think we were probably about 40 at the time, he and I, we were the same age. And he said, you know, I think you're one of the funniest men I've ever known, and there's no humor in your poetry. Because I was just, you know, trying to break bricks with my head or something. And I thought, why the hell isn't there any humor in my poetry? <laughs> and it's amazing how you learn these things from other people who have observed you and read your work and silently figured out incredibly careful ways of telling you how you might grow <laughs> without offending you. you know? it's, 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 they're, so, they're so lovely. Both go away from hell and Paul Peter was so generous in telling me what was wrong with my writing? <laughs> you know, I, I can never thank them enough. Uh, let me read some poems you probably, even if you know my work, probably haven't seen. Uh, because, because they haven't been published. <laughs> Robert Francis, who wrote a marvelous poem years and years ago, he's kind of forgotten he shouldn't be, the New Englander. We're not near New England anymore, are we? Uh, no, we're in, we're in the Midwest, where I come from. Uh, he wrote a poem about American rivers, celebrating the names of American rivers. And I, I love that poem. So I, I, I lived in Spain for a couple of years. I went from Reagan's California to Franco Spain to see what a perfect dictatorship was like. <laughs> Spanish rivers. Uh, one of them, the title one, has a, a 
Catalan name, which doesn't sound much like Spanish, but I love the name. It's a horrible name, in a way. The Llobregat. Catalan is a, I live in Barcelona. Catalan is a kind of pop language. It sort of sounds like Italian spoken by drunken German. <laughs> of the Yobregat. Two women and a small girl, perhaps three or four years old, resting in the shade of the fir tree. From far off the roar of the world coming back one more time. First a few words tossed back and forth between awakening men and then the machines talking to themselves in the language they share with the heavenly bodies. Planets, dust motes, distant solar systems that know what needs to be done and do it. So long ago, you think, those days, so unlike these, blessed by favorable winds and forgotten in the anthems we hummed on the long walk home from work with the childish fables we tried to believe. No one notices the small girl and her caretakers are gone. And no one huddles in the shade of the fir trees. The air, brilliant and calm, stays to witness. The single cloud lost between heaven and here stays. The mountains look down and keep their distance. Somewhere far off, the sea goes on working for itself. By the waters of the Obrega, no one sits down to weep for the children of the world. But the Ebro, the Tagus, the Guadalquivir, by the waters of the world, no one sits down and weeps. And a very different poem called Urban Myths. I love urban myths. You know, you find that you, you get them, you know, they're usually just lies, but <laughs> they, they're, they, they become in French. <coughs> you know, you hear them so often, even though you know they're meaningless, you begin to believe them because they make daily life seem more dignified or memorable. <laughs> Even though there's a part of me that always says bullshit. <laughs> never and who knows, maybe some of them are true. Maybe if we say them often enough, they'll be true. You know, like, like this is a democracy. <laughs> we all say it over and over that we elect the best we might come to believe it and kill ourselves <laughs> because if that's the best <laughs> what's the point <laughs> well we don't <laughs> so urban myth yes I was born in Detroit Detroit enters the poem in, in kind of like growing up. <coughs> Urban myth. So slow learner though I am, it took me one night to discover that rain in New York City is just like rain in Detroit. It gets you wet. <laughs> Even in the village, the streets empty out long before midnight. The comedy clubs stay open, but no one comes out or goes in. If there's music, it's the music in your head. The same music that became the theme song to every late night walk under the moon. In Detroit, 
No one walks under the moon, much less talks to it, or to the unseen stars that years ago we stopped believing were there. As for midnight walks in the rain in Detroit, they're regarded as urban myths, like dance halls, night baseball, or Fourth of July weekends. From Brooklyn, across the East River from New York, you can actually see the parades, the picnics, and the fireworks. The lovers crowd the Brooklyn promenade, waiting for hours for the final darkness to fall, full of hope that at last Manhattan will ignite. But it never does. It's exactly like Detroit, with more people, more money, and two rivers instead of one, and often a hint of an ocean. Brooklyn is different. The auto plants hum night and day. Most of the workers are old and look even older in their full beards, prayer shawls, and black big overalls. They're glad to make union wages. They feel useful punching in and punching out. When they're too old to work, they cross the Williamsburg Bridge to the city on warm evenings to stroll under a canopy of stars and the same moon that left Detroit before I finished high school. The more spiritual ones bike the Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan in hope of having a vision. They come back with amazing souvenirs, illustrated apocrypha, tiny reproductions of Miss Liberty, and rumors of a savior who rose from Michigan in 1928, rumors I helped create with my tales of the magic dogs who saved the synagogues. Everything I've written here is true, and the cities, Brooklyn and Detroit, are actual, and people still live in them. People you might love were you to venture east, like the Magi on their mad quest to touch a star and pass into history. I still go back each year to Detroit to relive my long childhood in the houses that burned down ages ago, to walk along the streets paved with gold, and to get wet. And uh, let me read one more recent poem. This is actually the last poem I finished. That's a, I, I, yeah, I was talking today, and uh, Christina uh, liked one of the words I used about, about what you do with poems that you sort of lost faith in. And, and you know, you don't throw them away, they sort of crowd you, begin to crowd you out of your house after a while. <laughs> and then one day you look at them and you say, holy cow, there is a poem in this crack. <laughs> and the word I used was, you rescue them. And she loved that word, and I, I think it's an accurate word, you rescue them. They've been waiting there. They've been saying in their quiet little way, Phil, <laughs> Last week, this is a little irrelevant, but so what? <laughs> Last week I had to take part in a thing for Dylan Thomas. He died a hundred years ago last week. And I was one of the few, they've only found one other. American poet who heard him read. And so they put on his play under milk at the 92nd Street Y. I heard him read at the 92nd Street 
why I could have read in Detroit. And they had me come back and, and talk about him. And I didn't want to talk about him. I wanted to talk about his poetry. Because they wanted to talk about what a bad fellow he was, how drunk he got, and what an idiot he behaved like, and how he chased all the girls and all the shit. That, you know, you know that we we throw people away with this gossip. And I wanted to talk about his poetry, and I finally shut people up. I mean, I had to actually say to one guy, "Enough." You've said enough. Now shut up. And then I talked about his poem. I was, I, was, I was up there with some other people and I was quite rude. <laughs> but I remember years ago a, a southerner I knew, a wonderful poet named Edgar Bowers, saying to me once, you saw me act that way in another situation and I felt a bit bad about being so rude and he said, Sometimes, Philip, you must answer rudeness with rudeness. And he's giving me a way up. And so that's what I did. <laughs> and, but I wanted to mention something that Dylan Thomas said the last time I heard him read. I never forgot it. He said, I send my poems out in envelopes. And sometimes the envelopes come back and I open them up and there are checks in there. <laughs> and sometimes there are the poem there are only the poems with their tails between their legs. <laughs> I was I mean I was like twenty three years old when I heard that I was thunderstruck. That he sees his poems as these little critters. <laughs> He's kind of sent out into the world to have their own careers. <laughs> some of them, some of them, they don't have enough teeth or enough guts or enough who knows what. Some of them fail. But they're your children. You love them. Or try, anyway. <laughs> and then many, many, many years later, maybe 15 years, my oldest son turned to me once at breakfast and he said to me another thing that I never forgot. He said, Dad, how many poems would you say you've got out there working for you? <laughs> Holy cow, I've become an entrepreneur. I have a small empire working poems. <laughs> Those two remarks have influenced more than, almost more than anything the way I feel about poems. <laughs> get them out there and give them a chance to work. Get them a, get them a living wage. <laughs> <laughs> Today I was talking to a group of students and I, met, I mentioned a marvelous writer, uh, Carlo Leva, who wrote the great book, uh, Christ stopped at Evelyn. And he wrote a marvelous book, Words Are Stones, about Sicily, which I read years and years ago and reread not long ago, actually last week. And it brought back to me this poem that I've been working on. Uh, and I think rescued. I rescued it about two months ago, I think. Maybe, maybe soon, but I don't remember exactly. It's called Sicilian voices. Something very like a person in blue work shirt and faded corduroys lies among the pepper plants behind the garbage dump. His face closed to all but the ants. Climb the hill that leads to the graveyard. Open the wooden gate and walk slowly among the stones the names and dates erased by rain. Not far off the sea, ride soundlessly toward shore. 
The deaf hear it as a prayer. To the blind, it is the music of eternity. To you, standing above it all, the sea is a vast panel of shades of black and white, and the woman off in the distance hurrying to the scene. There's no one you know. Perhaps she's the mother. Perhaps not. You should know that someday, not far off, it could be anywhere, when the wind's, when the wind's voice stills, you and that old woman will hear the same message whispered over and over for the rest of your lives. You can try to answer. But you need words for that. And you don't have any. I've sort of lost track of time, but it seems to me uh, I have time for two more poems. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Yes, I live in Brooklyn half the year, and I live in Fresno, California half the year. And especially when I was young, younger, I went into the mountains a lot. We were very close to the uh, Sierra Nevadas. And when you go up there, you can look down at the valley that we live in. We live in a valley between these huge mountains, the highest range in the lower 48, and, and a coastal range, and, and all the industrial, agricultural crap gets stuck there in the small, you know, automobile exhaust, all the garbage we put into the air. But when you get up there, you look down at it, Clear, and you know, oh, this is the world you were meant for. Uh, and when I first moved there to Fresno many years ago, 50 years ago, you could see those mountains every day. And now you can only see them uh, the day after it rains. This is called gospel, which, as many of you know, just means the good news. Gospel, and it takes place in the foothills and in the mountains. The new grass rising in the hills, the cows loitering in the morning chill, a dozen or more old browns hidden in the shadow of the cottonwoods beside the stream bed. I go higher to where the road gives up and there's only a faint path strewn with lupin between the mountain oaks. I don't ask myself what I'm looking for. I didn't come for answers to a place like this. I came to walk on the earth, still cold, still silent, still ungiving, I've said to myself. Although it greets me with last year's dead thistles, and this year's hard spines, early blooming wild onions, the curling remains of spider's claws. What did I bring to the dance? In my back pocket, a crushed letter from a woman I've never met, bearing bad news I could do nothing about. So I wander these woods half sightless, while a west wind picks up in the trees clustered above. The pines make a music like no other, rising and falling, like a distant surf at night that calms the darkness before first light. Suffing, we call it, from old English, no less. How weightless words are 
when nothing will do. Alfred Stieglitz, yeah, it's a famous book. I use a lot of photographs on my books. Uh, I, I, I like photographs. This one, I think, is, the, is, is what's, what's his name? Louis Hein, of a young, young girl who works in a cotton mill in South Carolina. 12-year-old, working full-time. Uh, in the years before laws passed by Democratic Congress to protect children. This is called the Mercy. A library that's mentioned in the poem is uh, the one the main New York Library on 42nd Street. I want to thank you, you, you as an audience. You've been so attentive and, and uh, receptive. I wish you... I have other readings coming up. I hope you appear. <laughs> <laughs> trying to eat a banana without first peeling it and seeing her first orange in the hands of a young Scot, a seaman, who gave her a bite and wiped her mouth for her with a red bandana and taught her the word, orange, saying it patiently over and over. A long autumn voyage, the days darkening with the black waters calming as night came on. Then nothing as far as her eyes could see in space without limit, rushing off to the corners of creation. She prayed in Russian and Yiddish to find her family in New York. Prayers unheard or misunderstood or perhaps ignored by all the powers that swept the waves of darkness before she woke, that kept the mercy afloat while smallpox raged among the passengers and crew until the dead were buried at sea with strange prayers in a tongue she could not fathom. The mercy I read on the yellowing pages of a book I located in a windowless room of the library on 42nd Street. Sat 31 days offshore in quarantine before the passengers disembarked. There one story ends. Other ships arrived. Tancred out of Glasgow. The Neptune registered as Danish. Umberto IV. The list goes on for pages. November gives way to winter. The sea pounds this alien shore. Italian miners from Piemonte dig under towns in western Pennsylvania, only to rediscover the same nightmare they left at home. A nine-year-old girl travels all night by train with one suitcase and an orange. She learns that mercy is something you can eat again and again 
while the juice spills over your chin. You can wipe it away with the back of your hands, and you can never get enough.